digital health is um, a new and emerging trend in, in healthcare. We can see um, a lot of movement, especially since the corona pandemic. And um, uh, what does that mean? Um, today, I'd like to look into five subtrends with you that define uh, the current and in the immediate future of digital health. Um, we'll look at cloud-based software. We will look at distributed sensors and variables. We look at apps for health and wellness and AR and VR, as well as point of care diagnostics. So um, if we look at cloud-based software, then um, this doesn't seem like a big novelty for anybody to be using Google Drive or uh, other services that run exclusively through a web browser where our data is stored somewhere on some server and only the system itself knows where that data is. Um, however, in healthcare and um, many different systems, especially here in Germany, you will find um, very rarely only the use of cloud-based cloud -based software. Um, even in many uh, countries and many states within Germany, um, cloud-based data storage is not allowed. So everything has to be on the premises of a specific institution. And obviously, uh, using cloud-based software has one particular technical goal. Uh, if we think about the way data is exchanged, then cloud-based software can really help us to enable interoperability. That means that we can share data also between different cloud-based services following the same standards and schemes. Now, why do we need to do that? Uh, what is the overall goal? And the overall goal is or should be intersectoral collaboration. So if I can exchange data, that means I can exchange services between my GP, my pharmacy, my payer, and my hospital, and that all um, on the press of a button or even without the press of a button. Now, uh, what does that mean for the patient? You want to have real-time availability of patient data. That means that a GP has access to the full record and maybe also the full data, current data of a patient. Um, we can much easier align on uh, treatments um, if it happens between different institutions. And we can think about um, better ways to automate and learn on that data. And um, if data is stored uh, in the cloud and in um, formats that are exchangeable, that are interoperable, then um, we can enable completely new processes and services. However, there's also a big discussion around this. Um, we need to understand who owns the data and how we actually exchange the data. So what is a valuable process um, when dealing with data in a distributed system? What is the diagnosis and the data the doctor enters, enters worth? And uh, what is the patient's data worth? What does the AI company um, anal analyzing the data earn? And um, a second discussion point is about data provenance. So can we be sure that a certain data set and item in our database is really correct? How do we make sure that we can check that really uh, another doctor has given that diagnosis and not um, that we are not working on fake data. So even though there's a lot of promises from uh, distributed data storage, from cloud-based services, um, there's also still a lot of work to do and a lot of discussions to be made. Our second topic and second trend in digital healthcare is about distributed sensors and variables. If you think that many of you are, for example, wearing a smartwatch, some of them can already track your heart rate, then you're actually already being monitored. You may not be a patient, but you're constantly monitoring your heart rate, which is a relevant KPI for your health. Now, um, this is obviously the technical goal. Uh, however, the overall goal in the future for you should be patient convenience. If you do not need to go see a doctor, if you can monitor um, someone in care, from afar, if you do not need to go to a hospital but can stay at home with all your vital parameters being tracked, then this has an, a serious impact on your quality of life. Now, this can be the heart rate, this can be other um, relevant uh, values like uh, blood tests, or you can imagine 
that you can even measure your brain activity from afar. If we all want that or not is a question that we need to uh, discuss because obviously um, if you think about um, being tracked all day, uh, then this may have serious effects on your privacy, but also on your psychology. Would I want to know how I'm feeling all day? What my health status is every day? Uh, would I like to have that feedback or not? That's a very important uh, discussion. A second point that is currently uh, discussed is the question of data quality and adherence. So how can you really be sure that a certain variable is actually on the patient in the right way so that what we measure is actually what happened in the body? And a third one, um, which probably will change when cloud-based services are the norm, is the ability to really use all that data on the physician's side. So if you think about the massive data that you produce only from one day of constant monitoring, um, how can we make sure that this data is well used for a proper diagnosis and that GPs or hospitals really have the time to do this? Um, I'm certain that we need more tools and different tools um, to help um, make use of all this data in a safe and secure and medically sensible way. Our third trend is apps for health and wellness. So if you here look at a technical goal, then obviously you would like to have health advice available for, to you 24-7. An app can do that. An app can work asynchronously. Um, your doctor can do it. If you want to have health advice from your doctor, maybe you can write to him. But um, obviously, if you have an automated response for many um, of your questions, there will be a decent answer. And um, it, like in all healthcare systems, um, the overall goal for the usage of health and wellness, well, wellness apps is uh, a certain cost reduction. So if you don't have to go see a doctor um, that often, because many of your questions can be um, perfectly explained uh, through an app, uh, through a qualified source of, of health information, um, then this can lead to an overall, um, to a less of a burden on the health system. Now, what does it mean for you? Um, using health apps can dramatically increase your patient satisfaction because you will get an answer when you need it. Uh, you will not sit in the waiting room. You will not need to go from specialist to specialist. Sometimes a healthcare app can help. In addition, um, it provides an approach to personalized healthcare. Obviously, it can treat and analyze data that you feed to it in a completely different way um, than a, a GP could just by, by, by looking at you. And if you have that on a constant basis, um, you, can, you can really try to, um, to optimize your healthcare in the best possible way. Um, obviously, nothing comes without a burden and healthcare apps are currently in big discussions. First of all, they are somewhat seen as a competition for care providers, for GPs, um, because obviously a big part of what a GP does is exactly doing um, these diagnoses and sometimes also additional treatment. So we need to find a good way for coexistence between apps and our GPs. And the second point is the real uh, medical value many apps provide. Now, currently this, this is a big trend all around the world um, where we see a new app for something coming up. And the question also here, like with sensors and variables is, how do patients really adhere to that treatment? And how can we be sure that uh, the digital partner, the digital companion that such an app offers is really creating the same value uh, overall? Our fourth trend in digital health currently is AR and VR. Um, so um, here the technical goal is to provide immersive interactions where we on the web currently have very many text-based or video-based interactions. These interactions are not really embodied. In a AR or VR system, you can move around uh, you with your full body, with natural movements, and um, uh, transfer your actions to another point on the planet. Now, that overall goal is a very much richer experience for patients and doctors. Uh, you can imagine um, that you can uh, assess a patient a lot better, do a lot better anamnesis if you see a digital twin in a virtual world, if the precision overall is uh, good enough. What you can also do and what has been 
um, what is currently being practiced is AR and VR training for many patients and doctors. Yeah? So better understanding for patients on what they have and for doctors on how they can improve their skills. Something that has been popped, popping up uh, during the corona pandemic when many people, also including doctors, didn't have access to physical training facilities. And last not least, um, if you look at AR and VR, we can also share resources globally. So remote assistance from patients and doctors uh, is something that has been done through video and also through very sensitive robotics. But what if we have a digital twin that works in a virtual world and can help us um, better collaborate with our peers wherever they are in the world? Now, um, as always, things come at a cost. And the question, if uh, AR and VR um, is really used uh, and really has real world effects is something that we need to discuss. Uh, um, who would want to wear a really um, clumsy glass or a VR headset that is uh, heavy. Um, now with um, a technical uh, innovation coming about where these things probably become the size of glasses or are uh, attached to a person in a different way, we can also see um, perhaps more, um, more uh, attraction of these devices and more use throughout the medical system. Our fifth and last trend is around point of care diagnostics. So currently, if you go see a doctor, um, he will probably take your blood and send it to a lab. That takes between four hours if you have high priority to 24 hours if it's low priority and sometimes longer. Um, now the question is, um, why uh, can we not do many of these analyses on the spot? Can we not generate higher speed in uh, when we analyze biopsies, when we analyze our blood, or when we do a genetic analysis. Now, um, the, the overall goal here obviously is to enable new processes in hospital and care. Um, if you can imagine how a hospital works, then it's very much focused on the care of the patient and uh, not so much on, on the actual lab um, results and the data-oriented management of, of healthcare. And um, if you think that there is a, a higher speed and a direct uh, point of care, a device that you can use in the future, um, you would also need new forms of labor in healthcare and care because somebody needs to be able to operate that device, to analyze the data, to come up with a joint um, conclusion on what that data means. And um, uh, this means that care teams in the future um, may need to um, completely change how they work together, how they collaborate, if data is more local, more direct, and um, diagnosis can change um, with the speed of analysis, right? And they can become more data-driven, and that means more evidence-based. And overall, this is something that we can all um, only hope and dream for um, because the more data we have and the more evidence we have, the more trust we can also establish in the system. Now, summarizing, we've looked at um, five trends. We've looked at cloud-based software, which will enable intersectoral collaboration if done right. We've looked at distributed senses and variables, um, which is um, a driver of patient convenience. We've looked at apps uh, for health and wellness, which can enable more personalized forms of healthcare. Um, and we looked at AR and VR solutions, which provide more immersive experiences for treatment or learning. And last not least, um, we looked at point of care diagnostics, um, which may lead to redesigned processes and new forms of work in the medical system.